This is Zeiss Presents Full Exposure, the weekly resource for news, trends, and the people who influence the world of photography and cinematography. Hosted by veteran photographer and filmmaker Jim Camp. We're excited to be in New York this week for Full Exposure at the Photo Plus Expo. For episode four, we're joined by concert photographer Greg Waterman. Greg has traveled the world, first as a photo assistant, then concert photographer and documentarian, and as personal photographer to Pitbull and System of a Down. We spoke with Greg right before he gave his master class in rock photography in Lower Manhattan. Hey everybody, how's it going? <laughs> you having a good time? So this is a unique experience for all of us, so let's try to have some fun. We're called Desert Sharks. <laughs> That'll do it. Greg, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having Appreciate me. Appreciate it. This is cool. Thanks. Appreciate it's it. Awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was uh, your early influences. Did you have any early influences when you were just starting out? How you got to you know, be doing what you're doing now? My earliest influences were people like Richard Avedon and Irving Penn, actually. Because when I first started my career, uh, in New York City in the middle 80s, I wanted to be a fashion photographer. Fashion and portraits, just amazing pictures of amazing people. That's what I wanted to do and that's why I came here. Um, and Penn and Avedon, to me anyway, represent the nth degree of all of that. I mean, they're just, they're masters at what they do and yeah. specifically, their biggest influence on me was the level of quality that was always there in every picture that they did, whether it was a, you know, one of Penn's still lifes of a cigarette in a gutter outside, or one of Avedon's eight by 10 Vogue covers. I mean, nth degree of quality and perfection in every frame, no matter what the subject matter or the final output was. So those were my biggest influences, and I still think that they're there when I'm trying to decide, should I keep that picture or not? No, it's not perfect, throw it away, that kind of thing. I have a good Penn story. I don't know if it's relevant for this, but when I moved to New York City after dropping out of Brooks, uh, I was friends with his first assistant well, because he went to Brooks too. So my very first, my very first interview in New York City was not at Penn's studio. It was with Irving Penn. No way. Wow. And I just dropped out of school. I thought it was this big deal guy. I was going to come to New York and set the world on fire. I was going to be so amazing. My first interview was with Penn. I'm just going to walk in there, impress him. He's going to be so, you know, amazed by my attitude and positivity. I don't know, whatever. And blah, 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 blah. And I went in there and he hated me. <laughs> he didn't like me. He didn't like my attitude. He definitely did not like my pictures. And he, I, I don't know, I just didn't do it the right way. You know, I don't know what to say, but yeah, he, kind of almost threw me out of his studio. Wow, that must so, have been... You have no idea. It took me forever to recover from that. Oh my God. But it was a good experience because I did come here thinking that I was, you know, I don't know, I, I came here thinking that I was going to do something and you, New York City puts you in check in a hurry with that, you know. It doesn't necessarily send you home, but it makes you realize where you got to be if you're really going to pull something off. Yeah, yeah. So. Did, you, did you do any assisting? Oh yeah, absolutely. Who, who, yeah, who else I, did you assist? I assist well, not who else, because I didn't assist Penn. Oh <laughs> I no, I, I'm sorry. Job. You're right. You're right. You're right. Right. I did not get that. Gig. Other than who else? Who you almost assisted? Um, I freelanced for a year, starting out working for like lots of people, just doing anything, just like everybody does. You know, picking up dry cleaning, sweeping floors, going to the grocery store. Nothing that had anything to do with gear and equipment and pictures. Uh, then I started working for some bigger people slowly. Uh, then my name got around. Then I started working freelance for people like Annie Leibovitz, Michelle Comp, Dennis Peel, Stephen Mizell, people like that. Uh, then this was in the middle 80s when Elle magazine was just coming over from France into, into the United States, it was just starting in New York. It was a big thing. I made a connection through a friend with Gilles Bensimon, the head photographer for Elle. He and I clicked and I became his first assistant for two years. And that was, as you can imagine, it was Two weeks in New York, two weeks in Paris, two weeks in New York, two weeks in Paris, two weeks in New York, two weeks in the Bahamas, two weeks in Paris, for two years. I mean, we were shooting every single day. If we weren't shooting, we were on a plane going somewhere to shoot. We'd shoot editorial during the day and then advertising at night. He was on that, that kind of level of fire. Wow. So that was a great experience for me because it exposed me to every situation that you can think of worldwide, famous people, models, advertising, whatever. 
um, a little bit of video, but not much. Um, so yeah, I did that for three years, and then I started out on my own. First starting for Elle Magazine, shooting tiny little pictures that kept getting a little bigger and a little bigger. At one point, I had like sometimes 20 and 30 pictures per issue, which was great because that's my photo credit each time. Other magazines started seeing me, uh, the other fashion magazines, but then Rolling Stone and Spin both noticed my portraits, and then they started hiring me to shoot music specifically. And I just gravitated more to that than fashion and just portraits of people in general, the music thing in general. I don't play, but I love music, and songs mean just as much to me as they do to everybody else. And I found a more of an interest in, and a permanence in shooting music. Like you take a picture and it's an album cover, take a picture and it's a t-shirt, take a picture and it's a poster in some kid's room. Uh, and I just, I thought that that was cooler. And I responded to the rock starness of the rock stars that I was working with. And that was kind of the energy that I fed off of. So that's kind of, that's how I got from where I started to where I am now. Mm. And that was 20 years ago when I moved to LA just to shoot music only. Mm -hmm. And that's been, that's what I've been doing since. I have a couple of friends, I did some assisting, I have a couple of friends that, um, you know, have stories like that. Of, you know, a good friend that assisted Mary Ellen Mark and, you know, uh, a lot of New York shooters and stuff. It's, it's a great training ground. It's amazing. Yeah. Ten million times better than going to school. Well, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> a lot of us, a lot of us didn't graduate, you know. Actually, when I was at Brooks, I was trying uh, unsuccessfully to get some kind of level of instruction there for assistance. And I always thought if I was going to start a school, it wouldn't be to teach people how to take pictures. It would be to teach people how to be a good assistant because then you could go work for the best photographers in the world and that's where you'll learn how to take good pictures. Not doing assignments in a classroom. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. like you should, like, I mean, it's not an issue now, but when I was assisting, you had to be able to load any camera with your eyes closed instantaneously while somebody was yelling at, come on, da, 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 da. And that's every 36 or every 12 or every 10 frames. Why wouldn't you taught that in school? Yeah. Anyway, we're talking about irrelevant things right no, now. No, 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 <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, I personally think, that nobody cares personally what I think, but I think, you know, a lot of, especially young photographers now, have no clue what it was like to come up in a, in a film world. Right. You know? But it and also if you're doesn't loading, matter. It doesn't matter at this point. I do mean, you you're think right, they don't have a clue. But it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter in some ways. But, I mean, how do you feel that film, because, you know, younger people now don't know about film, they might know if they're a little more technically aware that the digital is analogous to film, you right. know, exposure-wise and everything. But um, you know, like you said, you know, they don't uh, they don't know how to load a 120 back very quickly. Right. right. Well, the main thing that they don't understand is the f limitations of the science of photography because those don't really exist anymore. You know, we used to walk around with, you know, you put an 025M filter on your camera, that's 0 0.25 points of magenta, seriously? But you, that's because your lab was running green that week. And so that you had to do that, or you'd be outside at sunset, it's like, oh, it's way too orange, more blue, more blue, you know, whatever, and because your Kodachrome is going to look too weird. So they don't understand those things because right. you don't, because they're not issues anymore. You fix right. them and, later. And nobody knows the Instagram cross process filter is actually a quote, was, came from a cross processing yeah. of film, right? Right, you know? right, yeah. But, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that they're lesser photographers. <clears throat> or, I mean, we're looking, we're in a golden age of photography right now. I mean, camera gear itself exceeds what the human eye can even see. So talking about equipment and which thing you're using is more of a preference now than what's actually better. I mean, so yeah, it's, it's, we're in a completely different time now. So you have to think more about the images themselves. And to me, what I've, to me now, the most important thing about a picture is why are you taking it in the first place, you know? I mean, I can go outside right now and take a beautiful shot at sunset of that fire hydrant that's got all the graffiti painted on it, or I can go on Instagram and look, hashtag graffitied fire hydrant at sunset in New York City and find a thousand beautiful pictures of that same that fire same hydrant. Thing. Right. So why take a picture of it again, you know? Right. That's why I focus on doing something that I'm, that's why I like documenting things. You know, I'm creating something, but I'm, creating something from what's happening in front of me that's a unique moment, a concert in Mexico City or, you know, this sold out show here or somebody recording an album in a studio. So um, how do you get from, uh, just in general for people that don't know your work and stuff, get from doing portraiture, uh, mm -hmm. doing concert photography to making the leap to filmmaking? To filmmaking? Yeah. Uh, that happened out of 
opportunity and necessity. Uh, opportunity and that I was already standing in really, really cool places and had a great camera in my hand, which had a black button and a red button. And I was like, why? I pushed the black button enough times. Maybe if I just push the red button and hold still for 30 seconds, maybe I'll get something cool. And I did. And then when you take all those clips and give them to an amazing editor, then all of a sudden you have like a really cool video. So that was the opportunity uh, because I was in those situations already. The necessity was because of technology and because of the shakeup that the music industry has gone through over the last 20 years since Napster in 98, uh, there's not as much money on the table anymore. The budgets are smaller. So we don't get a photographer and a videographer anymore. We hire one person to do both because that's possible and it's easy to do and it's cheaper and it's more efficient. So I started doing that and wound up uh, gaining some clients because of that, but I also lost some clients. I lost a couple of bands because their videographer started taking pictures. Okay, fine, but then I gained a couple of bands because they liked having me around and I started shooting video clips. They left their videographer at home and just took me on the road. So it worked out both ways. And it, it wasn't, I, I never was, I never had any dreams or aspirations of being it. I always thought music videos were cool. I'm like, oh wow, look, visuals with music. Wow, that's a great idea. I mean, I remember when MTV started, you know, and I was like, oh, we were yeah. all fascinated by it. But um, I have no training in filmmaking. It's just, it, cinematography is, to me, my version of it anyway. Uh, it, it's literally just photography, but just holding still longer. That's, that's really all it is. I mean, I frame it nicely, it's lit. I've got my focus point where I want it, or I move my focus point from one thing to the other. I use good cameras, I use great lenses, and that's, that's my moment in time, and that's something that happened. And then I give all of those moments, again, to a really good editor. I only work with really good editors. That's one of my, not secrets, but it's just one of the things that I've always done, and I have to turn jobs down sometimes because there isn't the budget for that. But if I get a budget and I can hire somebody amazing, then every single thing that I do looks incredible. So you haven't wanted to play around with editing yourself? No, I tried it once. I made a 15 second video for Instagram, just a little behind the scenes thing that I made for Pitbull. First I had to teach myself iMovie, so I'm on YouTube, I'm watching all the tutorials. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. It took me eight hours start to finish from when I go, okay, I'm gonna do this until I was finished. And it was amazing, he loved it. Uh, it was approved, da, 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 da. but it was so frustrating. And like I said, it took forever. I, I don't have the patience to do it. And the, but the other thing, honestly, that, I, that I've understood now, only working with really good editors, is editing itself is an art form. And it's, there are people that are just great at it. Their brains are wired for that. They have the patience, they have the time. They can look at five hours of material knowing that they're gonna make something that's three minutes long and that's not overwhelming to them. They're just like, oh, here, here, and this, and start with this, and I think I'll fit. You know what I mean? And I've worked yeah. with those people, I've watched them do it. I've sat in the chair looking over their shoulder while they're doing this, and I'm like, no. Well, but working with them, you also learn about what you need to do when you're shooting, too. And that helps, yes. I'm definitely a better shooter by working with editors and watching what they do and thinking more about it. But yeah, I don't, I, and I don't call myself a filmmaker. It's, when you go to my website, it doesn't say DP or cinematographer or any of that. I, I just, I have a camera, there's two buttons on it now instead of one, and I'll push whichever one you want or both. Uh, and another thing that I do now, I'm really good at this, I can pull a still from video footage that'll, you would cry is how good of a photograph it is. And I do that all the time now. Okay, we'll do that here today. <laughs> Well, talking technical for a little bit, do you have bread and butter lenses when you're shooting a concert? Bread and butter lens. Well, my favorites. My, my favorite focal length is 35 millimeter. Mm -hmm. And when I'm finished with a job and I have all my approved pictures in a folder, uh, regardless of what lenses I was using, and even if I was using a zoom lens, which I use sometimes, um, all of the pictures are between 30 and 50 millimeters. Mm -hmm. I think part of that is... Uh, <clears throat> One reason is my proximity. Since I was going to say you have the luxury of being I'm, close. Right. I'm allowed to stand anywhere that I want. I don't take a booking unless I, that's, that's a provision in a job that I take. So that focal length works well for that. Um, it's, it sort of immerses you in the thing without actually distorting and starting to curve people, which I don't like. Um, it's fast. Uh, it just, it'll give you a little bit of background blur and separation if you want it to, but otherwise everything's in focus if you need it to be. Um, so yeah, like a 3514, something like that. Right now, though, the bot is 40 f2. That's I love that lens because I'm all about autofocus. We can talk about that if you want because I've switched to autofocus now. Um, 
I do use a zoom lens though sometimes. I'm in a situation where I'm having to do photos and video. I have no control over the situation, no start, no stop. It's gonna be for a short, concentrated amount of time and I have to get everything that I need and I'm not gonna be able to move then the zoom lens is my go-to, because if you're shooting video, how do you switch from one lens to the other? Right. You can't do it. Right. So. You can't do it. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about before, before we went on, um, coming from film. Right. And you know, maybe it's a little less relevant now because you know, the sensors are so great and everything. You know? And lenses are so much more you know, Everything advanced. is amazing. But um, what, what, what would you say to, to younger people to take away from that, of what you know, of photographers of our vintage got from that that maybe they don't get yeah maybe it's not so relevant now but still you got a lot from it uh, specifically you know uh, when I would shoot a concert especially shooting transparency film exposure was super critical right and I was I was a transparency shooter actually I didn't make the switch that people did in the 90s when everybody switched back from chrome to color negative film I didn't do that I stayed with slide film because I appreciated the finality of it like that's the way it's supposed to look there was no interpretation like there was a neg film so uh, for sure my being able to nail an exposure within a quarter of a stop made the transition to digital like shooting digital photography is a joke there's no excuse in any way shape or form for your picture to not be perfect and amazing and flawless and incredible I mean the parameters that I'm that we are all coming from from shooting film back in the day are it's you can't even talk about it the same way. And so I think the experience that I had shooting film, I, I can't say that it's invaluable, but it definitely makes me better. I can look at a photograph, I can look at skin tone, and it's like definitely too much blue. Not too much cyan, too much blue. But that's because I've had to do that before. Now I think it's just, you just slide it back and forth until you like the way it looks. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but if you have a better understanding of how good it could be and what it's supposed to be like when it's correct, I think it makes it easier to get to that point in the first place. But it's not necessary, it's, it's not. But, but gear is so, it's so good now, it's so forgiving, there's so many stops of latitude. Yeah. You, you can take a picture now where it looks almost like a misfire, like if it was on film, even on negative film, you still, even using a different paper and different contrast levels, and there's still no way it would be a throwaway for sure. Now you can make it a hero. It just. I mean, raw processing, the first time I opened a raw file and went, wait a second, look at that. And amazing, yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, it helps me, but it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's not necessary. I mean, it's not necessary, because look how many people are shooting now, and most people have no concept what any of that is like. And now Zeiss has a new camera with a computer built into it. One piece of equipment, that's all you need to own. Like, I could go on tour for a month with that camera and not take anything else out of the door. That's incredible. That is, I, I'm like, looking forward to seeing it. Yeah. It does sound incredible. It's incredible. So, based on that, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, we you should talk about autofocus if you want to talk about technology too. Sure, go ahead. Because I can riff on that. Riff I've been, on it. I've been shooting manual. I'm, I'm, focus is a big deal to me. Not auto exposure. Been. Right, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Um, but autofocus, I've been shooting manual focus my entire life. Well, not with my Instamatic camera in the 60s, but since I since I've per first picked up an SLR and went, whoa, 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 <laughs> wow. I was so fascinated by that that I kept doing it literally until May 25th of last year when I picked up my Sony A9. And this is not an ad for that camera. It was not given to me. I bought it and paid full retail for it. The autofocus system on that camera is so good that it made me switch. Hmm. And I've switched. I am now autofocus guy. Face detect, IAF. I mean, I can engage IAF on my camera and with my subject doing whatever they want to do, moving around however they want to move, the iris, not their eyelash or their face or maybe their ear or maybe their nose or their hair or their cheek or whatever, the iris of their eye wide open stays in focus the whole time. I'm not going to say anything about anybody else, but I'm not that good. I can't do that. I can't follow focus somebody moving. It, it's amazing. And so I've, I've changed to that and I've totally embraced it and I use it almost all the time except when it's not appropriate. And 
autofocus used to be terrible in, um, it used to be great for sports, why? Because the light never changes. Great for portraits, why? Because the light never changes. Concerts, not so much. Smoke, the light's changing 10 times a second. People's right. hands are waving. Right. Right. Somebody's moving here and changing there and da 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 da. Autofocus can get very easily confused. You know, when it's locked on something and then things go dark and then the lights come on again and see something else first, it's gonna go to that and then come back to the face. It's a nightmare. I'm not saying you can't do it, but I've always found, for me anyway, manual focus, even for concert photography, until last year was the way to go. Even using Zeiss Otis lenses, which are like, that's a 270 degree throw, yeah, I would still sorry. rather use those live because it gave me the ability to put my focus point where I wanted it. You don't have to do that anymore. I mean, seriously, the, the, the new cameras now with these face detect and IAF especially makes it, and when you're not shooting people's faces, you turn it off. You know, it's literally like that, on, off. Yeah, and what is it, something like 22 it? frames a second or something ridiculous like that? Uh, 20, 20, yeah, yeah, 20. Raw plus JPEG I mean, with basically like, like no like buffer. Film yeah, shooting that right, fast. exactly. Amazing. But I will say this though, yeah. uh, something to the younger viewers out there. If you look at the history of photography, all the way back to day one, the majority of the best pictures were still taken one frame at a time. And even now, when I crank my camera up to 20 frames a second, oh, I need to shoot the drummer on stage. Do I want the sticks here, 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 here? You still don't necessarily get the picture at 20 frames a second. You can sometimes still miss something. You can even miss something if you're shooting video at 24 frames a second, and then you go back and you're gonna pull that definitive frame where like, oh no, I want that. No, nope, not necessarily. It's not necessarily there, even at 24 frames a second. But you look at the shot of Lee Harvey Oswald being shot in the basement of the Dallas police station. That was a four by five speed Graflex. <laughs> One sheet of film, four by five exactly. inches Exactly. Flash bulb, not flash. <laughs> Boom. Exactly. Right when he got shot. Exactly. There's so, a reason why it's called the decisive moment. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that is the one thing the technology still does not really necessarily give you. That's a great point. It's st you still need to be right there. You need to and, be thinking. Yeah. You need to be thinking about what you're shooting. Absolutely. And you need to time yourself. I mean, I used to be really good back when I shot uh, a lot of fashion in the 80s. I was like white background, high energy guy, models jumping all the time. Well, you have to anticipate the action on something like that, especially like on a Hasselblad, you know, where like that's that's a mechanical release and you've got strobes and everything else. You don't push the button when you see the girl jump, you push it as she's getting to that point. It's like hitting a tennis ball. You know, you don't squeeze the trigger when they're hitting the ball. The ball's not even gonna be in the frame then. So yeah, there still has to be anticipation. The decisive moment, that's still one thing that will have at least a little bit more of a buffer with AI. I'm sure that AI eventually will be like, no, you squeeze the picture when the person smiles and their eyes are open, but there's still gonna be that exactly right point when you push the button. That like when, like when digital first came out, it was almost like that. You, know, it, right. it, it, you, you almost had to anticipate it because there was a lag. Mm -hmm. you know, for, for a long time, there was a right, lag. Right, right. Sure, especially if you were shooting live view. If you were shooting stills with live view, that was like slower than a, a, a film, film-based Hasselblad. Like you really had to be ahead of time to get that picture. And those Hasselblad motor drives were incredibly slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a frame a second, maybe. Yep, right. <laughs> Something I, yeah, like that's that. what I used. Every 36 frames, you have to stop and change rolls of film. Traveling with Ziploc bags full of film, yeah. like. Did you know you can put exactly 100 rolls of shelled 35 millimeter film in a gallon Ziploc bag? <laughs> it's exactly 100 rolls, I know that. Yeah, but that was a drag. Yeah. You know, you're gonna go someplace for two or three weeks, you're carrying hundreds of rolls of film, and then you don't see any of that until you come home. Yeah, you never shipped it. You never shipped them? It's too dangerous. Yeah. You know, was, we went to Mexico once, we shot 1,200 rolls of film, and never saw one frame until we came home. And I just, I went to the lab, put all 1,200 rolls of film on the thing, said run it all, and that was how we did it. And you had your Polaroid 669s. We did have our Polaroids, yes. <laughs> yeah, but I don't miss any of that. I don't miss having to wait for stuff. I don't miss dropping the film off, going home, driving back to the lab to look at clip tests, go home, right. go pick up the balances, right. edit them, FedEx them. Right. Yeah, yes. no, I know, I hear you, I have to agree and with you. And you know what, and I'm surprised that nobody, I've never seen an article about the positive environmental impact that digital photography that's obviously a, that's has. That's a good point. When you think about how many 
millions of gallons of chemistry a day and how many little plastic containers and paper boxes a day just in this city alone went into the trash every single day for decades and that's all gone. None of that happens anymore. No more plastic, no more paper. Wouldn't like to shoot Kodachrome once or twice again? Yeah, I would do it for the experience of doing it, just for fun, but at the same time... Find a lab first. Well, right, that, but it's like, I'm... I mean, I've been shooting professionally for 31 years, but I still consider myself a modern photographer, whatever that means. And if I shot a beautiful picture on Kodachrome, I'd be like, wow, that's a beautiful picture. What am I going to do? Walk around with a slide and just show it to people with a loop? <laughs> no, I'm going to go get it scanned. Well, as soon as you scan a piece of film, you are now dealing with an inferior digital file. Sorry I said that, but that's the, my opinion. It's an inferior digital file as opposed to a digital file from an amazing sensor and yeah. everything all. So if you're going to output it and use it in a modern capacity, you want to post it, you want to send it, you want to make an amazing digital print, da, 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 whatever, then it just makes more sense to me to shoot it on the best original source material possible. But I get the film thing and the film look, and, and if you can do that and you like that, and that's, I, have, I have a friend, he's a black and white portraitist, he mixes his chemistry from scratch so, okay, he loves that, that's his thing, not mine. <laughs> but, but do you think his files look that much different? Well, his files don't, but his <laughs> handmade fiber-based... His print, 20 I, meant by his, 20, I meant his prints. Yeah, yeah, his 20 by 24 fiber-based prints look beautiful. But once he takes a picture of them and then posts them on Instagram, they look pretty lousy, I think. <laughs> I mean, they just do. I mean, they don't look as good as the prints. The prints are pieces yeah. of art yeah. that you look like you could put your hand into. And you knock that so down to a two-inch JPEG. Them, though, you know? so few people get to see it. Right, I know. Thing, right? So, exactly. And for me, I, I'm a modern photographer, I'm a commercial artist, I want people to see my work. The more people that see it, the happier that I am. So, if I can post something, and it's going to go on an artist's social media, or blah, 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 the more, uh, more people see my work than if I was a newspaper photographer. I mean, because, and not because of the quality of my work per se, but because of the caliber of my clients. You know, they have a following where it's like, post something, boom million people oh, I like that that's cool yeah so and I like that I like my work being seen by as many people as possible as quickly as possible I tweet from stage sometimes yeah. you can do that now it's technically possible shoot a picture I like that Wi-Fi to the phone crop it bang millions have, of people are looking at it seconds have after you I shot have you, you you've shot uh, on stage with the with the new uh, camera no not yet no, I have to go through my phone to get to that first. But I've been doing that for years. I was even using iFi cards. I don't know if you ever used sure, those. I remember them. Yeah, they worked. They were a little buggy yep. and a little, but they worked. And you could you could literally get your pictures from your camera to your phone without any cables or anything else. And as long as you had an okay Wi-Fi network, piece of cake to send things away and whatever it was. I loved it. It was awesome. I had a Sony RX1 for a while. That has a a fixed Zeiss 35-2 on it, and. I shot entire jobs with that camera, and you, m myself, I never even thought. I wish I had another lens. That's no kidding, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because, of, because I'm allowed to stand wherever I want, that focal length works really, really well for me. And I think the other thing about a 35 millimeter focal length, again, just my opinion, but I think one of the reasons that it's such a popular reportage lens yep. is I think that lens, that focal length, more than any other, gives you the feeling that you were actually there. Like the biggest compliment that I get on my work from fans is like, wow, I felt like I was standing right there. I felt like I was right in the moment. I felt, uh, uh. well, that's what I'm trying to do. When you use a really wide lens, get all fisheye and things are getting curvy and wide and people get stretched, you're now, the impact, part of the impact of your photo is now from the optics that you're using to take the photo. Right, right. Like, wow, look how big it is. Yeah, but that's because your lens is saying that. And everything is distorted and things aren't real anymore. So that doesn't make you feel like you were there. That makes you feel like you're getting to see everything because the photographer was using a wide lens. Okay, fine. Tell the photo lens, if you're shooting concerts from front of house with a 400-2.8, okay, that's great. You've got that great shot of the singer and it looks amazing, yeah. but you can tell you weren't standing right next to him because right. it was shot from right, a long right, ways right, away. Right, 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 right. But with a 35 millimeter lens, more than any, even more than a 50, you're, you're, you're in closer. You know, the 50 still has that, I'm looking through a lens and this is my thing. But the 35 is kind of like this. It's kind of like looking through the 50 except without any edges to it. You know, and they say the 50 is the, that's the focal length of our eye. Okay, fine, but you don't have one eye, you have two. And really our vision is like this, but it's not wide because of the lenses in your eyes. So it, we can't replicate this experience. 
Yeah. Exactly. So the 35 you're saying is a little I closer think, to I that. think the 35 replicates it any closer because anything wider than that, things get distorted. And then once you do that, then it doesn't look like your real eyes anymore. But anything more than a 35, especially 50, 55, 60, 80, then you're starting to get yeah. into a look. The background drops out, you know, You know, for else. a long time, there were not many 40 millimeter fixed lenses. Right. Well, we kind of touched on this, but I'd kind of like to wrap up because I know there's a lot of people, young, especially emerging photographers that, you know, um, I mean, when we were both doing, you know, uh, concert photography in our youth, you know, you could, uh, you could get access to a band, you know, bands weren't as restrictive as they are now. Right. You know, bands, and, and bands have to be, you know, because they're protecting their copyright and not just their sound copyright, but their image copyright, right. you know. So, what do you say to younger photographers now that say, well, gee, I'd like to shoot a concert, but I can't get in. I can't, you know, they, you can't get in with any kind of professional looking equipment or anything, you know, just right. your phone. What do you, um, what do you give, what kind of advice would you give emerging photographers now? There's two levels. The first one is the one that everybody's going to give and is, is definitely legitimate. Uh, you just start off any way that you can. You find some kind of a source. You find somebody that needs music photos in whatever town you live in, because everybody does. Website, radio station, TV station, regional magazines, anybody that needs anything that can make a phone call for you to a band's publicist or a venue that will get you a photo pass. That's how you get in the door the first, the first way. That's just, that's just how you do it. Um, there are shows that allow you to bring in pretty decent hardware now. I'll be shooting and I'll turn around sometimes the person standing behind me on the other side of the rail has got a full frame camera with a 70 to 200 28 on it. I was like, how is that getting in? There? But some places let stuff in there now. You know, it's because of camera phones and whatever else. So if you can get decent gear in, then by all means do it. Otherwise, try to find somebody that will in any way, shape, or form legitimize you so that you can get in to take those pictures. Okay, now that being said, that's how you get in to take pictures of a show. Usually the first three songs, all you're doing is taking the same picture that everybody else takes in every other night, every city that that band is in another place. Uh, so, the way I did it, and the way that I recommend to people to do it, is you want to be, the, the way that you get, that you separate yourself out now as a photographer more than any time before, is you have to take pictures that other people aren't taking. Okay, like I said, you can't just go outside and take a picture of the fire hydrant because everybody's already taken pictures of that fire hydrant. Unless you can take a picture of that fire hydrant that nobody's ever taken. Like if you could get under the sidewalk and take a picture of looking up at it, for instance, or, you know, looking straight down on it. That's too easy to do now with a drone, but otherwise, you know what I'm saying? Sure. So, in shooting a band, oh, look, you've got a great picture of Ozzy Ben leaning over and screaming into the microphone. That's a great picture, such a nice job. Guess what, 20 people take that picture every night that he plays as he travels around the world. Yeah. So I don't care how good of a picture that is, I don't care how sharp it is, how many megapixels, what lens, which way you processed, your filter, blah, blah, don't, what doesn't matter. You're just taking a picture of Ozzy screaming into the microphone. Now take a picture of Ozzy from behind him, looking over his shoulder at the 20 photographers taking that picture. That's a cool picture. And that's a picture not anybody else can get. Okay, fine, but how do you get on stage? That's not easy. You have to prove to somebody else that you're legitimate and good enough to be given that access. Okay, because if they just let anybody get on stage, pull somebody out of the audience, they're gonna be dancing on stage and taking pictures, that's, that's silly and foolish and a waste of time. It's a liability. The pictures are going to suck. They'll probably fall, whatever. So this is what I did, and this is the way that I advise everybody to do it, and it's it, what worked for me. It's not the way that most people do it, but it, this is how it works for me. You find a band locally, wherever you are, that you like. You like them, they like you. You have to like their music because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them. I'm talking about unsigned bands. Somebody that plays in your local bar to five people, they play to their moms and their friends and that's it. But you dig their music or you have a crush on the singer or whatever, anyway, there's something about them. It's like yeah. you present yourself, nice professional, hey, can I hang with you guys? Just whatever, let me take pictures, I'll give you, give, give. I will give you everything. You can use it for whatever you want, da 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 Sound checks, performances, rehearsals, writing, recording, driving from here to there in a van, Anything that they're doing as a band, as a unit, document that, photos, videos, give it to them. Let them build a huge social media campaign, but then be keeping the choice moments for yourself. Then when you get to a certain point, build a portfolio, not of 20 great pictures, Ozzy screaming into the audience and uh, Coldplay and uh, 
Marilyn Manson and Britney Spears, whatever. Nobody cares about those individual pictures because everybody takes those individual pictures every day. But show somebody a portfolio of a band, any band, it doesn't matter, they'll get the drift. They're like, oh, okay, you're like hanging with these guys. You're like, da 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 and you're, you're like embedded with them, in other words, you know, like right. anything else. That body of work will be viewed differently by a publicist or a magazine editor or a band manager or even just a singer from a bigger band. You know, like when you have that portfolio, you take that body of work and you present it to somebody, somebody bigger who hopefully you will impress, who either is part of a bigger band or has access to a bigger band, and so on and so on and so on. I started out with one band that nobody had ever heard of, and I just did it, da 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 da. Then I took those pictures and showed those to another band that was signed. They never became anything, but I rolled with them and went here and went there, and da da da. Then I showed those pictures to somebody's publicist at a record label. He put me on the road with Mudvayne, sent me to Europe, documenting their tours, traveling all over the United States. I showed those pictures to Lincoln Park. That got me embedded with that. I was that band's photographer for almost 10 years. They even, that was shot on film mostly, by the way, too. They even took my pictures and made a, this a book, like printed on paper, a 200 page coffee table book, bestseller on Amazon, mm -hmm. both editions sold out almost immediately. Then those pictures got me System of a Down. System of a Down got me Pitbull and so on. And I know it sounds like a long process and it was, it took 20 years, but it was baby steps, but each time it was a bigger band, a bigger act, a better venue, a better tour, more money, more publicity, more exposure. But that's how I did it because I was taking pictures that you usually don't see. You usually don't see pictures of bands hanging out in their rehearsal space just kicking it or in a recording studio. That's a hard place to get into. You have to be like, you're a chosen one if you get in somewhere like that with a bigger artist, but you're not going to get that without showing somebody that you've already done that before. Do you know what I mean? So it's literally a catch-22 thing. You can't get the thing without the experience, so you have right. to get the experience first. But the cool thing is there are bands everywhere and there's venues everywhere and there's always somewhere you can take a camera. You know, there's plenty of medium size. Even in Los Angeles, you want to walk into the Whiskey or the Viper Room or the Roxy, depending on who the band is, they'll let you walk in there with anything. They don't care who you are or who you're with. It's different now. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you when it changed the most for me. It was back in the early 2000s, you know, and it, we've all seen that sign, no cameras allowed at concert right. venues and yep. patting down and metal detectors and whatever. Now they're looking for bombs and guns because that's yep. what we're more worried about. Yep. But I was at the Roxy in Los Angeles. I turned around, there was a sign on, on the wall. It was above the band's merch table and it said, did you get any cool pictures of us tonight? Send them to us and we'll put them on our MySpace page and we'll give you credit. And I'm like, that's my job right there. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's where it went. Well, and, and also I think probably should say that whatever advice people take from you about doing that, doing whatever they can, giving a band a picture, get credit for it at least. Yes, get credit, but don't watermark. I don't watermark my pictures because I think that looks tacky. But yeah, definitely get photo credit because that matters because then people see the photo credit and that will build on that too. But the primary thing is the images. Don't get caught up in hashtags, don't get caught up in credit, don't get caught up in getting paid because you're not gonna get paid in the beginning. You'll be lucky if you ever get paid shooting music, actually. Um, but in the beginning, for sure not. And the better way to be is just give them everything. They're not doing anything with it. Unless they're printing t-shirts and generating revenue yeah, off of your photos, yeah, yeah. don't worry about it. It's, it's not worth it. it. It's much more important to have your stuff seen by as many people as possible. Great way to wrap it up. Okay. Thanks a lot, Greg. Was that enough? Really Did I give you enough it. insight on who I am and what I do? And yeah, sure. Okay. Of course. Thanks for tuning in. Join us next week for another edition of Zeiss Presents Full Exposure. If you can't watch, you can always catch the audio-only version on iTunes and Spotify. Follow us on Instagram at Zeiss underscore Full Exposure or on the web at ZeissFullExposure.com. And to learn about the latest in Zeiss lenses, head to Zeiss.com. <laughs>